Friends, thank you for joining the Philomathian Society this evening as we celebrate 200 years of raising hell with our brains. Sometimes in a rather literal way. Um, my name is Paul Mitchell, and I'm a member of the Philomathian Society and its annual oration director this year. Now, tonight we are convened with about 1,500 of our closest friends to take part in one of the Society's oldest and dearest traditions, the annual oration, a free public lecture by a prominent intellectual on a topic of scientific, cultural, or philosophical importance. Now, before we begin, I would like to thank you all for coming, congratulate you on getting a seat, and ask that you join me in uh, thanking the many co-sponsors who have helped in making this evening possible. Could we have a, a round of applause for our many co-sponsors? Now, particularly, uh, I would very much like to thank the Office of the Provost and the Penn Museum for their generous support and their unflagging enthusiasm for this event. Uh, and I think that uh, as a result of their efforts and the efforts of all of our co-sponsors, we're going to be enjoying one of the most edifying nights of the year here on campus. So uh, now I do beg your indulgence uh, as I issue a few personal thank yous uh, to my many Philomathians uh, for all of the time and talent you put into this event. Thank you. I would especially like to applaud the efforts of Chris Willis, John Mel, Barlow Holly, Holly Tanashi Manzo, Kyle Hardgrave, Andrew Jakubowski, Hasbrook Bailey Miller III, Emmett Wynn, Nora Castle, Kat Cleveland, Casey Boaz, and James Kwok. Uh, I would also very much like to thank my mentors and friends here this evening who have contributed greatly to help making this event a success. Peter Dodson, Michael Weisberg, Stephen Stitch, Martin Seligman, Lisa Gemmel, and especially Janet Monge. Thank you. Without their efforts and their inspiration, this event would not be possible. Now, just a few quick notes on logistics. The oration this evening will uh, last for approximately 50 minutes, followed by a Q&A session. We'll give instructions about the question and answer session following the oration. Uh, in the back, there's literature provided by some of our co-sponsors, including the Free Thought Society, American Atheists, as well as PA Nonbelievers. We'll also be selling books. From what I understand, we've either run low or out of books. The Penn Bookstore is just around the corner. We're going to be signing books this evening after the event, so feel free to, to grab some books and get your books signed. So, back to, the, back to this evening's uh, events. The annual oration. It's special this year for two reasons. First, it's Philo's Bicentennial, and as the oldest collegiate literary society in the United States, we're proud to continue 200, a 200-year 200 mission of promoting the learning of our members and increasing the academic prestige of the university. Second, it's the provost's year of proof, and we and the rest of the University of Pennsylvania uh, community have been engaged and entangled in considering the nature of proof and the process of questioning how we come to know what we know. Now, in that vein, the particular question which drives our inquiries tonight is the following. Where do we draw the line between our science and our philosophy? When we discuss science as a way of knowing what is the extent of our epistemology. From prying apart the biochemical mechanics of life to revealing the shadows of a counterintuitive quantum world, over the past 200 years, the sciences have advanced to a point that our understanding of the contours and the contents of the universe is forever changed. Furthermore, we now understand our place in nature as evolved organisms, as enculturated apes, constrained by our evolution to finite intelligence, but faced with deeply challenging questions about the foundations of our knowledge, our purpose, our values, and the history and future of our planet. What can proof possibly mean in the teeth of such questions? Of course, we are not engaging in the Herculean task of pondering these dense imponderables alone. Indeed, we are in very good company. I am proud to introduce Dr. Richard Dawkins as the Philomathian Society's 2013 Annual Orator. Richard Dawkins is the former Child Samani Professor for the Public Understanding of Science at Oxford University and the, one of the world's most um, prominent evolutionary biologists and outspoken atheists. Among his books are The Selfish Gene, The Extended Phenotype, The Blind Watchmaker, Climbing Mount Improbable, The Ancestor's Tale, The God Delusion, The Greatest Show on Earth, and most recently, The Magic of Reality, How We Know What's Really True. 
Now, Dr. Dawkins is renowned not only for his beautifully lucid prose and his vocal criticism of intelligent design, anti-scientific thinking, and religious fundamentalism, uh, but also his theoretical contributions to advancing the gene-centered view of evolution and coining the term meme to describe the evolution and spread of cultural information. These ideas have fueled discussion and debate concerning the basis of evolutionary change and the nature of culture for decades since, since they were first presented in his 1976 bestseller, The Selfish Gene. In recognition of Dr. Dawkins' pioneering contributions to evolutionary biology, the scientific study of human culture, and his eloquent promotion and defense of a naturalistic understanding of our species' history and evolution, I am pre pleased to invite Dr. Julian Siggers, Williams Director of the Penn Museum, to the stage to present the 2013 Wilton Krogman Award for, in life, for, for Lifetime Achievement in Biological Anthropology to Dr. Richard Dawkins. Julian? Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. And um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's, um, it's an enormous honor to share this stage with Richard Dawkins tonight. The Krogman Award is given to those individuals who are pioneers within the related fields of human evolutionary studies. In the spirit and application of Krogman's work, the recipient's research must be synthetic, interdisciplinary, and integrated into lifelong dedication to education and a service to all humankind, so an easy task. Krogman's own research found ways to illuminate the importance of biological and cultural variation to evolutionary process. His database encompassed the vastly diverse communities of Philadelphia, where he studied the growth and development of inner city children from conception to adulthood and eventually to senescence. His work continues today in the Krogman Growth Center as it enters its eighth phase of research. His research with the famous Samuel Morton collection at the Penn Museum laid the foundation for his seminal work in forensic anthropology, where for the first time, the techniques and analysis of physical anthropology were applied to real world legal cases in the relentless pursuit of proof within the criminal justice systems. Now, so far, there have been three recipients of the Krogman Award, and tonight, we're very pleased to add a fourth. The first was F. Clark Howell, often considered to be the father of paleoanthropology. Howell excavated many Paleolithic sites in Africa and Europe and found many fossils of our ancestors. He told the stories of Paleolithic like, expertly combining the analysis of fossil hominid bones with archeological contextual evidence. Ralph Holloway was the second recipient. He was a pioneer in the study of the, the, the evolution of the brain and developed the field of paleoneurology applied to the human fossil record. The last recipient was Donald Johansson, a paleontologist who transformed our knowledge of the fossil record of human evolution with his excavations at the site of Hadar in Ethiopia. He found the famous fossil Lucy, whose 40% complete skeleton forever changed our view of the earliest phases of human evolutionary history. And tonight, we honor the fourth recipient, Dr. Richard Dawkins. Dr. Dawkins synthesized real-time evolutionary process with the analysis of genetic processes that underlie the transformation of species. Much like Darwin in the 19th century, Dawkins marshals vast amounts of data that overwhelmingly show how natural processes, heavily based on a growing knowledge within genomics, can explain life on Earth without reference to a supernatural being. In his more popular work, he has brought evolution into the living rooms of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a warm round of welcome to the latest recipient of the Krogman Award, Dr. Richard Dawkins. What an honor, thank you very much indeed. I must say, in Oxford, we go back more than 200 years, but, and we think we've got some pretty good buildings, but I think I've never, ever given a lecture in a building quite as splendid as this one. And 
What a magnificent... Okay, Proof, Science, and Skepticism. I'm not quite sure where that title came from. It certainly didn't come from me. Um, um, I, I thought I was originally asked to talk about my latest book, The Magic of Reality. And um, a couple of days ago, I looked at the website and saw that I was billed to talk about proof, science, and skepticism. Um, so I hastily uh, concocted a compromise and... Um, looked at my book and decided what I would do would be to take a chapter which I've never actually lectured about before. Usually I lecture about chapter two, and today I'm going to lecture about chapter 10, which has a bit more to do with proof, science, and skepticism than the rest of the book. Um, the book is a book for children, or for young people anyway, and I hope you'll bear that in mind. Um, so in a sense, listen to it as though you are a child as T.H. Huxley said, sit down before the facts as a little child. The book has several chapters. That virtually all of them begin with a question. And then the beginning of the chapter it might be what is an earthquake, what is the sun, what is a rainbow, etc. Uh, the beginning of the chapter has um, uh, myths in answer to the question. So myths about earthquakes, myths about the sun, myths about rainbows, and so on. And then finally we come on to the science. What really is a rainbow? What really is an earthquake? Uh, what really is the sun? One of the chapters that I usually talk about is who was the first person. And my conclusion is there never was a first person, which some people find paradoxical. But the opposite would actually be more paradoxical. Um, but today... Rather than talk about scientific facts, which is what most of the chapters are about, I'm going to talk about um, a more pedagogical chapter, something about how we, how we think about things, or how children should think about things. It's a chapter called, Why Do Bad Things Happen? And uh, as I said, I want you to bear in mind that it's written for children, and so we're trying to dispel uh, misconceptions that children might have, and I dare say a few adults have as well. So why do bad things happen? After a terrible disaster, like an earthquake or a hurricane, you may hear people saying things like, it's so unfair. What did those poor people ever do to deserve that fate? Or if a really good person gets a painful disease and dies while a bad person remains in the best of health, once again, we cry, unfair, it's one of the favorite children's uh, sayings. Where's the justice in that? It's hard to resist the feeling that somehow there ought to be a kind of natural justice. Good things should happen to good people. Uh, bad things should happen to bad people if they have happen at all. Um, many of you may know Oscar Wilde's wonderful play, The Importance of Being Earnest. And the elderly governess, Miss Prism, uh, who explains how long ago she wrote a three-volume novel. And when asked whether it ended happily, she replied, the good ended happily and the bad unhappily. That is what fiction means. <laughs> Real life, of course, is different. Bad things do happen, and they happen to good people as well as bad. They don't single out good people, but they're as likely to happen to good people as bad. So why do bad things happen? Coming on to a few myths, lots of people believe that their gods intended to create a perfect world, but unfortunately, something went wrong. And there are lots of different ideas about what went wrong. Um, there are lots of legends in Africa about how death came into the world. All over Africa, many, many tribes, I remember this from my own childhood in Africa, many tribes believe that the chameleon was given the news of everlasting life and told to carry it to humans. But unfortunately, the chameleon walked so slowly that the news of death, carried by a faster walking lizard or some other fast walking animal in different parts of, of Africa, got there first. In one West African legend, the news of 
eternal life was brought by a slow toad, but unfortunately was overtaken by a fast dog, bringing the news of death. I'm a bit puzzled by why it matters when the news arrives, but anyway, that seems to be the way these legends, lots and lots of legends. Disease is a special kind of bad thing, and disease has spawned numerous myths of its own. Uh, and one reason for this, I suppose, is that disease is mysterious. Our ancestors faced other dangers, lions and leopards and things, from enemy tribes, the threat of starvation, and those you could understand. But smallpox, say, or the Black Death, or some other terrible plague or malaria, uh, must have seemed to pounce from nowhere without warning. And it was unclear how to guard against this terrible misfortune. It was a terrifying mystery. And so people, it's no wonder that they resorted to superstition when desperately trying to understand where disease came from and resorted to magic spells, supernatural spells. Uh, in many African tribes, until quite recently, uh, if you had a sick child, you'd automatically look around for um, an evil magician who was casting a spell or a witch. If my child has a high fever, it must be because an enemy paid a witch doctor to cast a spell on her. Maybe it's because I couldn't afford to sacrifice a goat when she was born. Or perhaps it's because that green caterpillar walked across the path this morning and I forgot to spit out the resulting evil spirit. Even today, a surprisingly large number of sick people travel to places like Lourdes, where they plunge into a sacred pool in the hope that the holy water will heal them. They're probably more likely to catch something from the other people who've bathed in the water. About 200 million people have made the pilgrimage to Lourdes in the past 140 years, hoping for a cure. Uh, in most cases, there's not a lot wrong with them, and thankfully, they mostly get better as they would have anyway without the pilgrimage. Once when I was at school, our teacher asked us to think about why diseases happen. And one boy put his hand up and suggested it was because of sin. There are many people even today who think that sin is responsible for the cause of bad things generally. Some myths, very widespread myths, suggest that Bad things happen in the world because our ancestors did something wicked long ago. The Jewish myth of the uh, founding ancestors, Adam and Eve, as you know, is based upon the idea that they committed a terrible, terrible crime. They ate the fruit of a forbidden tree. And this mythical crime, this original sin, has reverberated down the ages and is still regarded by many people today as responsible for all the bad things that happen. Why does anything happen? It's a complicated question to answer, but it's a more sensible question than why do bad things happen, although I'll come on to a special sense in which it is sensible to ask why bad things happen later. There's no real reason to single out bad things for special attention unless there's some reason to think that bad things happen more often than we would expect them to, by chance. Or unless we think there's some kind of need for a natural justice, which would mean that bad things only happen to bad people. Well, do bad things happen more than we would expect by chance alone? Uh, on the whole, no. Many people refer jokingly to what they will call Murphy's Law or Sod's Law, which states that if you drop a piece of toast and marmalade on the floor, it always lands marmalade side down. More generally, if a thing can go wrong, it will. We joke about this, but I think a lot of people actually do have a sort of sneaking feeling that it's more than a joke. They actually feel that uh, the world's out to get them. Um, oh, yes, that's a, um, a, little, a little anecdote. I do a certain amount of filming, and filming people have to um, be very careful about external noise. You have to worry about planes going overhead and so on. Um, and it's very annoying because if a plane goes overhead when you're um, trying to film a piece to camera, you have to stop and do it again, and it's very, very irritating. And on one occasion when I was filming, we went out to a remote meadow um, with miles from many buildings near Oxford, 
And we thought, it was very early in the morning, we thought this would be safe. And we, when we got there, we discovered a lone Scotsman <laughs> practicing the bagpipes. <clears throat> Sod's law, we said. Um, it doesn't have to be toast. Um, you, you, you toss a coin, and there's a, there's a sort of feeling that the world is cussed. You, you desperately want it to come down heads, and so the wretched thing comes down tails. Um, some people think the more you want something, the more likely it is that it won't happen. Um, if there's any truth in that, it's simply because you notice it when it doesn't happen more often. That's the pessimistic view. The optimistic view, the opposite. The more you want it to come down heads, the more it will. You could call that Pollyanna's law. Uh, the optimistic belief that things usually turn out for the good. You could call it Pangloss's law, after the character of Voltaire. Uh, his Dr. Pangloss thought that all is for the best in this best of all possible worlds. Well, you can quickly see, of course, that both Sod's law and Pangloss's law are nonsense. Coins and slices of toast have no way of knowing the strength of your desires and no means of fulfilling them or thwarting them. And what's a bad thing for one person may be a good thing for another. Um, you've seen uh, rival tennis players, both of whom pray fervently for victory, and both of whom think God gave them victory when they win. Um, no particular reason, presumably, why God should favor one over the other. Well, people sometimes say everything happens for a reason. And in one sense, this is true. Um, things have causes. Uh, tsunamis happen, terrible tragedies like tsunamis happen because of a reason, in this case because of an undersea earthquake. And earthquakes happen for reasons we now understand, um, shifts in the earth, Earth's tectonic plates. So in this sense, everything does happen for a reason. But people will often use reason in a different way, a moral reason. They will say something like, the tsunami was a punishment for our sins. The reason for the tsunami was to destroy the strip clubs and discos and bars and other places of sin. And it's amazing after a major disaster how often you will see uh, people, preachers and so on, um, saying such things. Perhaps it's a hangover from childhood. Child psychologists have shown that very young children, when asked why, for example, a particular test asked why to the children think that rocks are pointy. And they're given an alternative between a geological explanation for why rocks are pointy and a purposeful explanation, which is they're pointy so that animals can scratch themselves when they get itchy. And b before a certain age, most children prefer the teleological explanation, prefer the explanation that the rocks are sharp for a reason of benevolent purpose. And then they grow out of that uh, later. Many people believe in runs of good luck or runs of bad luck, or they may believe that some people are luckier than others. Or they may say, I've had so many bad things happen to me lately, I'm due for a bit of good luck. Um, in the, well, the law of averages is, is an example, the fa fallacious law of averages. Um, in, in the game of cricket, it, it really matters uh, which team bats first. Um, there's often an advantage in batting first. And so the captains toss a coin to see who will get the choice of batting first or batting second. And many people believe that some captains are better at winning the toss than others. Uh, there's a news, a news article about a match between India and Sri Lanka, and it said, um, it asked people, will Dhoni, that's the Indian captain, be lucky once again with the toss? And they had a competition for answers, and the winning answer was, I firmly believe in the law of averages, so my bet is on Sangakura, that's the Sri Lanka captain, being lucky and winning the toss. E e Dhoni, the Indian captain, had won the toss in a series of previous matches. Coins are supposed to be unbiased, so the misunderstood law of averages ought to see to it that Dhoni, the Indian captain, having been lucky so far, should now lose the toss to redress the balance. Another way to put it would be to say it's now Sangakura's turn to win the toss. It would be unfair 
if Dhoni won the toss yet again. But of course, the law of averages is nonsense in that case. It's true that if you toss a penny a thousand times, you'd expect approximately 500 heads and 500 tails. But if you've already tossed the penny 999 times, and it's been heads every time, what would you bet for the last toss? According to the law of averages, you should bet on tails, because it's tails is turn. But needless to say, everybody in this room would bet on heads, because quite clearly this is a biased penny. And of course, it's complete nonsense to say, I, mean, I don't need to tell you this, but children perhaps do need to be told, it's complete nonsense to say you can bias your luck, improve your luck, by wearing a lucky charm or crossing your fingers behind your back or anything like that. Um, there are people who are described as accident-prone, but that should only mean that they're clumsy, like um, Inspector Clouseau. Um, Bad things happen to Inspector Clouseau because he's a bumbling oaf, not because uh, of some kind of um, uh, statistical law. Now, to come on to something a little bit more biologically interesting, there may be a good biological reason why something like Sod's law is true. Um, of course it's true that the universe has no mind, no feelings, no personality. The universe is not out to get you. The universe is not out to make things difficult for you or bad for you, nor is it out to make things good for you. You have no right to expect uh, any sort of comfort or the reverse from the universe. The universe doesn't know or care about your existence. Some people find that hard to accept. But now, having said all that, I pause for thought. I do have to admit that there is something a bit like Sod's law because of Darwinian natural selection. Although it's definitely not true that something like the weather or an earthquake or a flood is out to get you. If it gets you, that's just too bad. It's not out to get you. It's not deliberately scheming to get you. Nevertheless, when you turn to the living world, uh, if you're a rabbit, a fox is out to get you. If you're a minnow, a pike is out to get you. I don't mean that the fox or the pike are scheming to get you, although they may be. They may have brains that are big enough to scheme. But evolution by natural selection has seen to it that even viruses, and certainly foxes and pikes, behave in ways that are actively bad for their victims. And if their victims take steps to evade capture or infection or whatever it is, then these menaces, these enemies, take active steps to penetrate, to counteract the um, steps that you take. Earthquakes and hurricanes don't do that. They do terrible things, but they don't make it, they don't improve their ability to make things worse for you. Natural selection really does. Natural selection sets up what you can call evolutionary arms races, arms races between predators and prey, parasites and hosts. The more prey animals evolve to become better at evading predators, the more evolutionary pressure there is on the predators to become better at catching the prey and vice versa. And so there is an escalating arms race run not in animal time, but in geological time, an escalating arms race between predators and prey, between parasites and hosts. And when you look at beautiful adaptations that appear to have been beautifully designed, like eyes and claws and teeth and running legs, these are the end products or the intermediately end products of an arms race, usually against predators or against parasites. Predators and parasites really are out to get you. Uh, this is an ant lion. It's a little insect. It's an insect larva that lurks in the little pit that it digs for ants to fall in. This is the ant lion, and the, and the ants tumble into the pit, and the ant lion eats them. Um, now, the ant lion is out to get the ants, and, it, and its, its adaptation to dig the pit 
and to develop the jaws that it has. This is an adaptation to get ants. It's out to get the ants. It looks as though it has foresight. It looks as though it plans it. Of course, it doesn't. Its nervous system's too small for that. But you can interpret it as though it does. Now, it's easy to see that predators uh, are out to get their prey, but there is a sense in which prey are out to get their predators, working for the downfall of their predators. They work hard to escape being eaten, and if they all succeeded, the predators would starve to death. Uh, and the same thing happens, holds between par parasites and their hosts. So on both sides of the arms race, the obvious side and the less obvious side, uh, it's true that there's a kind of malevolence uh, against the other side. It's different from earthquakes and, um, and the weather. Now, um, this has consequences for the sort of mental attitude that is set up in the brain of an animal. Imagine that you're a rabbit and you see in the long grass there, you see a little rustling. It could be the wind. It could be the non-malevolent wind in which case there's nothing to worry about. But that rustle in the long grass could be a predator. And that predator is out to get you. That lynx is most definitely out to get you. Um, so the animal, the rabbit in this case, has a difficult balancing act. It's got to toe a line between being too risk averse, which means startling at every puff of wind that rustles the, that rustles the grass. And if it does that, if it's too risk averse, then it'll never get any feeding done, it'll bolt whenever anything happens, and it'll die of starvation, whereas its rivals, who have not uh, been so risk averse, will, will prosper better. On the other hand, being too gung-ho, being too uh, eager to get on feeding, and never mind the danger, is likely to end up being eaten by in this case, the lynx, but it could be a leopard, it could be a lion, whatever it might be. Now, in the language of Charles Darwin, the language of natural selection, we could say that those individual animals that act as though Sod's law was true might be more likely to survive and reproduce than those individual animals that follow what we might call Pollyanna's law. But on the other hand, if they act too much as though Sod's law is true, then they go to the other extreme and they don't get enough feeding done. Our ancestors uh, in Africa, where they spent so much of their time, millions of years, um, were in mortal danger from lions, crocodiles, leopards, pythons, and so on. So it probably made sense for our ancestors to be, to take a suspicious, even paranoid view of the world, to see a likely threat in every rustle in the grass, every rustle in the forest, every snap of a twig to assume that something's out to get you, a deliberate agent scheming to kill you. And I suppose even today when we hear a noise in the night, our immediate thought might be, is it a burglar? Is it a ghost? Uh, we're more likely to jump to that conclusion than we are to the conclusion that it's just a creaking of the timber. And maybe this is one reason why so many people uh, take a view that the world is out to get them. Now, um, predators aren't the only things that are out to get us. There are parasites too. Parasites are a more sneaky threat, but they're very dangerous. Um, and um, I want to talk a little bit about them now. Um, the body, as you know, has an extremely ingenious and very effective system of natural defense against parasites of all kinds, the immune system. It's too complicated to talk about in detail. Briefly, when the immune system detects a parasite or, or a cancer, something like that, um, the body is mobilized to produce special cells which are carried by the blood into battle, like an army, tailor-made to attack the particular parasites concerned. Usually the immune system wins, which is why we're all still here, uh, and the person recovers. And after that, the immune system usually, quote, remembers the molecular equipment that it had to 
develop in order to deal with that particular, to win that particular battle. And so next time it meets the same threat, the same pathogen, uh, it remembers it and is able to deal with it quickly, which is why when you've had a disease like measles or mumps, um, you're unlikely to get it again. And people used to think before we had vaccines for, for it that um, it was a good idea when a, when a child had a chance to get mumps or, or measles to, to, to infect the child so that it wouldn't get it later, um, especially with mumps, because mumps, is a, when you're a child, is pretty unpleasant. But it's far more unpleasant if you're an adult, especially an adult male. Vaccination is a much better way of doing that, of course, and vaccination gives you a mild dose, stimulates the immune system with a mild dose or a, a, a killed strain of the virus or whatever it is. But once again, we have a difficult discrimination problem. It's analogous to the problem of the rabbit and the, and the lynx. The immune system has the task of deciding what is foreign and therefore to be, to be fought, that's to say the suspected parasite, and what it should accept as part of the body itself. And this is particularly tricky, that's why I put a picture of a, of a scan of a, of a, of a baby. Um, when a woman is pregnant, the baby inside her is foreign. Babies are not genetically identical to their mothers. Half the genes come from the father. And so, unless very special steps are taken, the baby would be likely to be rejected by the immune system. And this, is one of, this was the big problem, I suppose, one of the big problems anyway, that had to be solved by the immune system um, when uh, mammals or other cr creatures developed vivipary, developed um, uh, live, live bearing. And it works. I mean, plenty of babies do manage to survive in the womb long enough to be born, but there are also plenty of miscarriages, uh, which suggest that evolution may have had a hard time solving this problem of distinguishing between a genuine foreign body and uh, the baby, which is, which is foreign, but is, has to be treated specially. And even today, many babies survive only because doctors are on hand, for example, to change their blood completely as soon as they're born in some extreme cases of immune system overreaction. The immune system can get it wrong by fighting too hard against a supposed attacker, which might turn out not to be an attacker. Um, this is what allergies are. The immune system needlessly, wastelessly, damagingly fights harmless things. Pollen in the air is normally harmless, but the immune system of some people overreacts to it. And that's when you get the allergic reaction called hay fever. You sneeze, your eyes water, it's very, it's very unpleasant. Um, and in some cases, allergies can be lethal. You know, there are some people who can't eat peanuts, and if they have the slightest trace of a peanut, they, they die. Sometimes an overreacting immune system goes so far that the person is allergic to himself, autoimmune diseases. For example, alopecia, your hair falls out in patches. The body attacks its own hair follicles. Psoriasis is another example. And again, it's not surprising that the immune system sometimes overreacts because there's a fine line to be trodden. It's the rabbit and the lynx all over again. A fine line to be trodden between failing to attack when you should and attacking when you shouldn't, as in the rabbit and the lynx. Is it a rabbit? Sorry, is it, is it just the wind or is it a lynx? Is it a predator? And I suppose we should wonder whether people with a hyperactive immune system, with things like psoriasis, are paying the penalty of allergies or even autoimmune diseases like that, they might be less likely to suffer from um, certain kinds of uh, viruses and other parasites, maybe even cancer, um, because they have an overactive immune system. Maybe the price you pay for being very good at getting rid of real parasites is that your, uh, your hyperactive immune system actually fights against your own body sometimes. Once again, the problem of being too risk-averse or of being too gung-ho 
Treading the line is difficult, and there are penalties for straying off that line in either direction. Cancers are a special case of a bad thing that happens. Um, it's a strange one, a very important one. A cancer, as you know, is a group of our own cells that have rebelled, that have broken away from doing what they're supposed to do and have become parasitic. Um, they usually group together in a tumor. The tumor grows out of control, feeding on some part of the body or robbing the body of its own food. And the worst cancers then spread to other parts of the body, metastasis, and eventually kill it. Malignant, as they're called, tumors. Now, the reason cancers are so difficult to deal with is that their cells are our own cells. They are our own cells slightly modified by mutation. They evolve to become, by natural selection within the body, to become better at being cancers, but they are still our own cells. And that means that, unlike, say, a, a, a worm or a bacterium, which can be attacked with poisons, in the case of bacteria, antibiotics, um, which, which, uh, which kill the bacterium but not us, um, that's relatively easy to achieve because the bacteria are not us. But the cancer cells are our cells. And so a poison that kills the, the tumor is likely to kill our own cells as well. And as you know, chemotherapy and radiotherapy and so on are very unpleasant and they are very debilitating. And it, the reason is quite simply that, the, that, 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 that whatever it takes to kill a cancer tumor is pretty much the same as what it takes to kill, the, to kill our other cells. Now, I want to end th this particular part of my talk with a, with a speculation. I'm wondering whether it's possible that autoimmune diseases, think again of the rabbit and the lynx, autoimmune diseases might be a byproduct, a byproduct of an evolutionary arms race. I talked about evolutionary arms races between predators and prey before. An evolutionary arms race between cancer and the immune system run over many ancestral generations. The immune system wins battles against precancerous cells. We all of us, from time to time, develop precancerous cells, which, unless the immune system detects them, have a risk of developing into a proper malignant tumor. And mostly, the immune system wins, and we never know anything about it. Occasionally, it doesn't win, and the cancer um, wins. So the immune system wins battles against precancerous cells. And my suggestion is that in its constant vigilance against precancerous cells, the immune system sometimes goes too far, treads too far over the, that side of the line, goes too far and attacks harmless tissues. After all, the harmless tissues are very similar to cancerous cells. And an immune system which is too ready to attack finds itself attacking our own cells, as it were, mistaking them for uh, cancer cells. And I'm wondering whether the explanation for autoimmune diseases could be that they are evidence of evolution's work in progress in an arms race against cancers. Now, I've been asked to say something about proof, and um, so I, I thought I ought to stick something in about proof, although it's not in the book. Um, the word proof is used strictly by mathematicians. You prove something when you show that it follows deductively, inescapably, from axioms. The Pythagorean theorem about right-angle triangles, which is immensely useful in all sorts of fields, is proved deductively, once and for all time, for all right-angle triangles in a plane surface. It's necessarily true. You don't have to go out with a ruler and measure hundreds of triangles in order to know that Pythagoras' theorem is correct. And most biological facts, most of the things we know about biology are not like that. We do have to go and take lots of observations, analyze them statistically, set up hypotheses, models, test them experimentally. Um, some philosophers would say we attempt to falsify our models, and a model that sticks its neck out, a model that's vulnerable to being falsified, yet is not falsified, is a good model, a successful model. 
the more vulnerable it is, the more precise the predictions that could have been disproved but are not, the more, va the more precise the predictions that are not falsified, the more we are inclined to accept it as true. But this is not proof in the mathematical sense. Nevertheless, it's still powerful evidence for believing that something is true. There are some things that we can do in biology which you could think of as armchair deductions. And I want to single out one, uh, which is close to my heart. Um, there is a controversy in biology at the moment over the subject of uh, the evolution of altruism in kin, in related organisms. For example, especially the social insects, um, where many of you may know that um, the majority of biologists interpret the astonishing feats of the social insects, of ants, bees, and wasps, and, and termites, as a result of natural selection acting on kin. The worker ant is a sterile animal which cannot reproduce. And the reason why workers do what they do, which is feed other ants, feed larvae, which is protect the nest, which is take great risks. Um, bees sting with a barbed sting which kills them. They're, they're kamikaze fighters. The reason why sterile workers do this is that their genes, the genes that make them do it, have copies in the young reproductives, in the case of ants, the young winged queens and males. And so if a gene makes a worker ant behave altruistically towards a young queen or a young male, then the gene has a good chance of being present in the body of that young queen, which is going to reproduce, or has at least a chance of reproducing. This is the theory of kin selection, and it was developed by my Oxford colleague, he wasn't at Oxford then, W.D. Hamilton, uh, his theory of inclusive fitness. It was renamed the theory of kin selection by John Maynard Smith, and it has been the dominant account of the evolution of the social insects ever since the, the 1960s. Uh, it is now under attack from, I suppose, the most distinguished worker on social insects today, which is um, e. O. Wilson, Edward O. Wilson, who, and I don't want to go into detail, but he is now saying that, all, that his earlier espousal of the theory of kin selection was wrong. Um, and uh, Wilson is himself wrong in this, and I haven't time to go into, into it, except to say that he mistakes the logical status of the theory of kin selection. He writes as though he thinks that kin selection is a new theory that has to be added to the classical neo-Darwinian synthesis of the 1930s and 40s. The classical neo-Darwinian synthesis of the 30s and 40s, which recast Darwinism in genetic terms, joined up Darwinian natural selection with Mendelian genetics and recast evolution as changes in gene frequencies. That's the way it's been since the 1930s. That's the neo-Darwinian theory. That's the theory that everybody in biology subscribes to today. Wilson talks as though Hamilton's theory of kin selection, working for collateral kin rather than your own offspring, as though Hamilton's theory of kin selection is an extra theory that's kind of bolted on to the neo-Darwinian theory of the 1930s. That's his mistake. It is not. It follows deductively, mathematically, from the neo-Darwinian synthesis as Pythagoras' theorem follows from the axioms of Euclidean geometry. Wilson is, in fact, doing the equivalent of Pythagoras going around with a ruler and measuring hundreds of right angle triangles to see whether they obey Pythagoras' theorem. That's not what it's about. You could deduce, you can deduce, Hamilton's theory of kin selection deductively from the depths of an armchair without ever leaving the armchair. It's another question entirely 
whether the particular idea of collateral kin actually applies in practice to a particular species. It probably does not apply. You don't actually need to think about collateral kin in many species of animal, but the theory is still there. It's still the pressure towards it is still there, that, and that is a deductive consequence of the neo-Darwinian synthesis, which follows inexorably, ineluctably, mathematically, deductively, from the uh, synthesis of the 1930s. And here's another example of armchair thinking, which has the flavor of mathematics, although it's not a totally rigorous proof. Once again, you could do it in an armchair. People sometimes say, was there ever an Adam and Eve? And of course, there wasn't in the sense of Genesis. But then people will say, well, yes, but there probably was. What about African Eve? What about mitochondrial Eve? What about this, this woman whom we're all descended from? We get all our mitochondria, which come down through the maternal line. What about mitochondrial Eve? There is empirical genetic evidence that a woman did indeed uh, live in Africa something over 100,000 years ago, who gave us, all of us, our mitochondria. Mitochondria that we inherited from our mother, from our maternal grandmother, our maternal maternal great-grandmother, and so on. That's empirical, empirical work. The point I want to make now, though, is that it is logically necessary that there had to be such a woman it's nice that we've got the empirical evidence, but actually, from the depths of your armchair, you could have concluded that, yes, there has to be a, a woman from whom we are all descended, from whom we get our, all our mitochondria. There are, I'm going to distinguish three different individuals. Mitochondrial Eve, Y-chromosome Adam, and our most recent common ancestor. And all three of those necessarily had to exist, although we don't necessarily know when or where. Our most recent common ancestor is the individual from whom all of us are descended most recently. And I can prove to you, by the mathematical technique of reductio ad absurdum, that there had to be such an individual. In fact, I can prove something rather more striking than that, which is that if you go back sufficiently far in time, in a time machine, you will find that every individual you meet, as you open the door of your time machine and get out, every individual you meet is either the ancestor of all living humans or of none of them. There are no intermediates between them. That's a rather remarkable fact, and I can prove it to you without ever leaving the armchair. Um, or conversely, going forwards, we can say that of all of us in this room, if we go sufficiently far forward in time and look at humans in the remote future, there are some of us in this room who will be the ancestor of everyone alive, and there are other, others of us in this room who will be the ancestor of nobody alive. And there are no intermediates. It's either everybody or nobody. Isn't that a striking thought. Is it a striking thought? Yeah. Um, here's the proof. It's the, it's the mathematician's method of reductio ad absurdum. Suppose we go back ludicrously far. Suppose we go back to the Devonian era where our ancestors were fish. And so I can trace my ancestry back to a fish, and so can you. My fish has got to be your fish because in order for that not to be true, the descendants of my fish and the descendants of your fish would have had to evolve in parallel through the same intermediate pathways all the way to becoming humans, chastely refraining from ever mating with each other. That's the only way in which it could be true that my, my, my fish is different from your, from your fish. So there has, to be a most, a, there has to be a fish which is the ancestor of every human, and there are other fish of which are maybe its contemporaries, who are the ancestors of none. Now, it's easy to see that that's true if you go back as far as a fish. We don't have to go back ne nearly that far. 
um, we only have to go back... Um, well, it's, th then it becomes a matter of more detailed calculation and an actual empirical measurement to say how far we have to go until we find an individual who is the most recent common ancestor of every single one of us uh, in the world today. And that individual probably lived a matter of a few tens of thousands of years ago. That is not mitochondrial Eve. Mitochondrial Eve is our most recent common ancestor in the female, 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 female line because mitochondria only go down the female, female, female line. Mitochondrial Eve lived earlier than our most recent common ancestor because there are so many more ways of being an ancestor than just the, the, the maternal, 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 maternal line. You can be an ancestor by going father, um, grand, grandmother, great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather, great-great-great-grandmother, and so on. There are millions of different ways of being an ancestor. And so obviously, given all possible ways of being an ancestor, our most recent common ancestor has to be a more recent one than mitochondrial Eve, since mitochondrial Eve is the most recent ancestor down only one pathway, this trickle of genes down the right-hand end of the family tree. Similarly, Y chromosome Adam. All males have a Y chromosome, no females do. All males get their Y chromosome from their father, their paternal grandfather, their paternal paternal great-grandfather, and so on. Once again, the trickle from the left-hand end of the family tree. So Y chromosome Adam has to be um, another one who is earlier than our most recent common ancestor. But Y chromosome Adam, by a totally different line of reasoning, probably lived more recently than mitochondrial Eve. And certainly, Y chromosome Adam never met mitochondrial Eve. The reason I say Y chromosome Adam lived more recently is that there are more ways of having descendants if you're male. You're more likely to have lots of descendants if you're male than if you're female. And the reason for that is that a male is capable of having hundreds of descendants. And one or two males in history have. Um, if you look at the Y chromosome of uh, many peoples in Central Asia, they all derive from a single male who lived around about the time of Genghis Khan. Mule Ishmael the bloodthirsty had more than 800 children. Um, he also had the charming habit of uh, mounting his horse with drawing his saber as he did and beheading the slave that held the bridle as a method of quick release uh, as he got into the saddle. So many of us may well be descended from Mule Ishmael, the bloodthirsty. Many of us may be descended from Genghis Khan. Um, we are all descended from, all, from um, Y chromosome Adam. Um, and our, if we're male, our Y chromosome derives from Y chromosome Adam. Um, and he probably lived a lot more recently than um, mitochondrial Eve. I'm now going to end by reading the final paragraphs from The Magic of Reality, uh, which talk about, the, um, about magic and miracles and how real science is always to be preserved. I haven't talked about that in this lecture, but it's in the title, The Magic of Reality, and there is a chapter on miracles. And it's sort of a response to the claim that scientists think they know everything. There are things that not even the best scientists of today can explain. But that doesn't mean we should block off all investigation by resorting to phony explanations invoking magic or the supernatural, which don't actually explain at all. Just imagine how a medieval man, even the most educated man of his era, would have reacted if he had seen a jet plane, a laptop computer, a cell phone, a sat-nav device. He would have called them supernatural, miraculous. But these devices are now commonplace. We know how they work. People have built them, following scientific principles. There never was a need to invoke magic or miracles or the supernatural. And we now see that the medieval man would have been wrong to do so. And we don't have to go back as far as medieval times to make the point. A gang of Victorian international criminals equipped with modern cell phones could have coordinated their activities in ways that would have looked like telepathy to Sherlock Holmes. In Holmes's world, a suspect in a murder case 
who could prove he was in New York the evening after the murder was committed in London would have a perfect alibi because it was literally impossible in the 19th century to be in New York and London on the same day. The eminent science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke summed the point up as Clarke's third law. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. The very idea of levitation has long been a byword for the supernatural, for mysterious magic. But I'm going to show you a little film now, a demonstration from the superconductivity group of Tel Aviv University of a feat of levitation that's done by purely naturalistic physics, quantum physics. Levitation is no longer a, mis a miracle, it's physics. I just levitated above the track quite high, and I can just rotate it. So it's actually floating above the surface. Yeah, it's not floating, it's locked above the surface. So it could, you could tilt it at an angle and it would yeah, still fly it around. Yeah, like this, and it will just go around like this. Because I go and put it at different height, and then like this. And lock it at the height. Lock right. it, yeah, different height, different configuration. Right. And I can even lock it at the uh, opposite way. If you could just hold for a minute. Okay. I, I'm doing the same so thing. Hang I'm locking down. it upside down, and then it is suspended. The more you think about it, the more you realize that the very idea of a supernatural miracle is nonsense. If something happens that appears to be inexplicable by science, you can safely conclude one of two things. Either it didn't really happen, the observer was mistaken or was lying or was tricked, or we have exposed a shortcoming in present day science. If present day science encounters an observation or an experimental result that it cannot explain, then we should not rest until we've improved our science so that it can provide an explanation. If it requires a radically new kind of science, a revolutionary science so strange that old scientists scarcely recognize it as science at all, that's fine too. It's happened before. But don't ever be lazy enough, defeatist enough, cowardly enough to say, I don't understand it, so it must be supernatural, it must be a miracle. Say instead, it's a puzzle, it's strange, it's a challenge that we should rise to. Whether we rise to the challenge by questioning the truth of the observation or by expanding our science in new and exciting directions, the proper and brave response to any such challenge is to tackle it head on. And until we have found a proper answer to the mystery, it's perfectly okay simply to say, this is something we don't yet understand, but we're working on it. It's the only honest thing to do. Miracles, magic, and myths, they can be fun, and I have fun with them throughout the magic of reality. Everybody likes a good story, and I hope that readers of this book will enjoy the myths with which I begin most of my chapters. But even more, I hope, that in every chapter, they enjoy the science that comes after the myths. If you read the book, I hope you'll agree that the truth has a magic of its own. The truth is more magical in the best and most exciting sense of the word than any myth or made-up mystery or miracle. Science has its own magic, the magic of reality. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dawkins. Thank you, Dr. Dawkins. All right. So now we move into the question and answer section of the uh, annual oration. I will note this is a question and answer session, not a declaration and answer uh, session. Um, I would ask that if you have a question, uh, you come to one of the three mics uh, in the rows here in the main auditorium. Um, we have three philos who will be able to assist you. What we ask you to do is you run the question by them. We're just making sure that nothing's repetitive uh, or inflammatory. Uh, but we're very uh, eager, or Dr. Dawkins is very eager to a answer any questions you might have. So I think uh, what we'll do is we'll begin uh, over there on the audience's right. Over here? Yes. Hello. 
Um, so after listening to all this, I was just a bit confused about what is your belief on God? Because I think it is right to say that we need to prove things before we believe in them. So I come to the con conclusion that we don't know if God exists or not. Is that the same conclusion you shared? Yes. Um, we don't know for certain if leprechauns exist, fairies exist, hobgoblins exist. Um, we don't know all sorts of things. And until we do, then we take the best evidence that we have and we don't waste our time believing in things for which there is no positive reason to think that they do exist. Uh, so um, we, we cannot disprove the existence of Thor and Odin and Jupiter and Zeus, Mithras, etc. Um, and but until there's any positive evidence for them, we don't waste our time with them. Hello, Professor. Um, um, thank you for coming here today. Um, you've inspired me to get into biology. Um, um, in the past, you, you've expressed your preference for um, uh, television programs like uh, Jacob Bernowski's uh, Ascent of Man and uh, um, Carl Sagan's Cosmos um, over, um, say, uh, more modern programs that are uh, they, that cater to um, the, the attention span of, of, of uh, the public. Um, in the past, when you've uh, prepared for your Christmas lectures, or um, uh, when you uh, when you're writing the book, The Magic of Reality, um, how much did you uh, focus on the level of, of appeal of 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 the the, the subject matter, and um, um, if um, like what what is your philosophy in trying to package the material to um, gain uh, to to try to. Uh, um, um, make the public understand right. the topics you're trying um, to express. I mean, I, I think s science can be difficult, and so um, it, it's, it's all too easy to sugar the pill and to um, only talk about the, the sexy, um, fun aspects of science and bangs and smells and things. Um, to teach science in a coherent way, I think you have to do, do the whole thing. But all of science should be interesting. It's a very uh, complete... Not, not totally finished complete, but it's, it's a coherent um, um, body of theory. Um, I think, obviously, you have to be very clear. Um, Einstein said everything should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. Um, so it's, you, 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 you can't gloss over the, um, the difficulties. Um, Try to put yourself in the position of the listener or the reader. And this is obvious, but many people don't really do it very well. Um, say to yourself, if, if I were reading this, how would, I re how would I react? Would I understand it? I find that when I'm writing a chapter, say, I will almost inadvertently find myself reading it again and again, over and over again, each morning when I start a fresh work, I will read through the chapter yet again. And again, inadvertently, I find myself reading it through the eyes of a different possible person. And it, it's not a deliberate thing. I don't have a kind of checklist of, of, of imaginary readers. It tends to be just a person that I've just been speaking to on the phone or something like that. And that person, she's in my mind because I've just been speaking to her on the phone. And so when I get, next start reading the chapter, I will, as it were, see the word through her eyes. And if, if I think she wouldn't like something or wouldn't get a point that I'm making because I haven't made it clearly enough, I'll change it. And so the chapter goes through a sort of Darwinian process of being naturally selected through the eyes of many imaginary readers. And I suppose that, as in any Darwinian process, that improves it. Um, you mentioned the Christmas lectures. Uh, the Christmas Lectures are an institution started by Michael Faraday um, in, when he was head of the Royal Institution, and they're given every year in the Royal Institution in London, um, five lectures given to children, and um, nowadays, for about the last 40 years, they've been televised by the BBC or some other company. Um, and I, I gave them one year. It's a major undertaking. You kind of give up a whole year to preparing the Christmas Lectures. It's a great privilege because they are such a British institution. And it, there is this a tradition started by Faraday of having demonstrations. 
Um, Faraday didn't have slides. What he had was demonstrations. He would call people out. He would do demonstrations on the bench. And that tradition has persisted. And so um, I got a lot of help with demonstrations that would inspire the children and calling the children up to, um, to assist, rather like, a, rather like a, a conjurer does. And you find that when preparing demonstrations, the fact that you're giving the Christmas lectures is a key that opens all doors. And so you can ring up a company that manufactures electron microscopes and say, I'm giving the Christmas lectures this year. They say, right, what can we do for you? Um, and they will hire a truck and ship a, a, an electron microscope um, into the lecture theater so that you can demonstrate it. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge privilege. But not everybody has that privilege. And if you haven't got the, the facility to actually lift an electron microscope and put it on the table for, put it on the floor rather, um, nevertheless, you couldn't use, use other simpler demonstrations than that. Um, metaphor, I think, is important, using analogies, using metaphors to try to explain things. You have to remember not to let metaphor go too far. There are some people, they're often called theologians, who are incapable <laughs> of distinguishing metaphor from reality. <laughs> metaphor should illuminate reality. It shouldn't take the place of reality. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, two questions. Thank you so much for your talk, Professor Dawkins. The first question involves religion. Um, you met with a rabbi from the Society for Humanistic Judaism. First, is a religion of humanistic religion X of atheists good in your eyes? Um, and the second question is, um, there is a group of transhumanists who believe that eventually science will move into the realm of human beings living forever. I was wondering, what do you think of transhumanism? What do you think of transhumanists? Are they crazy? Are they rational? Um, what do you think? Well, those are two quite different questions. Um, uh, human, humanistic religion, humanistic Judaism, or whatever it might be, um, there are people who think that when you've given up the supernatural, you're left bereft of, um, I don't know, ceremony, ritual, the companionship of going to church. And there are people who think that we need to substitute something like that. And so they will have um, humanistic ceremonies, humanistic rituals, humanistic meetings, perhaps. I mean, Unitarians, to some extent, do this, I think. Um, and my feeling is, if, if that's what you need, go for it. I, I don't feel any need for ritual or, or anything like that. Um, but I'm, I'm not hostile. To the, to the idea, except insofar as people mi mistake it and think that because you, you're, you're having these humanistic ceremonies that therefore you do believe in the supernatural. I haven't looked into transhumanism at all. Um, I suppose I take a kind of science fiction -y view, a sort of Arthur C. Clarke view, that um, just as Clarke's third law says that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, that's looking at the past. If you look in the future, um, anything that can be done probably will be done. And there's nothing in principle impossible about extending the human lifespan um, a, a, for a very long time. Um, whether it's a good thing to do would be another matter. Um, there would be ethical concerns about whether if the present generation discovers how to live forever, um, that means that there's no more reproduction. There better not be any reproduction or, 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 or you know, the, the world will just become full of, of, of solid human flesh. Um, uh, so um, th that, that, that particular ethical consideration would have, to be, would have to be taken care of. There's also a personal consideration. Um, I'd, I'd quite like to live a bit longer than I'm going to, but um, uh, somehow going on for millions of years, I think we'll probably get a bit boring, would you think? Um, anyway, that, that's a personal, I mean, I, I don't have anything illuminating to say about that. As someone who uh, doesn't believe, or obviously doesn't have a God to turn to, and also unfortunately has a lot of the world against the athe atheists, um, what, do you ever feel lonely? And also, uh, <laughs> well, I'm ser I'm serious. It's serious. Um, do you ever feel lonely, and what do you turn to for solace? If I felt lonely, 
I would not turn to some ethereal spirit for solace. Yeah. I, would turn, I would turn to some solid human companionship. Um, even if it were true that a lack of a divine companion left people um, unhappy, miserable, lonely, uncomfortable, that, of course, is the worst possible argument for the existence of this spirit. Um, the world, the universe, doesn't owe us comfort. And so if the, the thought of there being no God or no afterlife, whatever it is, makes you feel uncomfortable, Sorry? <laughs> if the thought... <laughs> if the thought of being, of having no God or no afterlife makes you feel uncomfortable, that's just too bad. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thomas Nagel has recently written, and I'm paraphrasing slightly here, that it's premature to assert that strictly Darwinian processes can account for the existence of the mind. Speaking more broadly, part of the issue is that physics, which of course chemistry is based on, which of course biology is based on, has not yet been able to posit a means whereby discrete particles that possess only objective physical states could produce whole subjective perceptions. That, and, of course, we don't want to rely on emergent properties because that would be an act of faith, and we don't believe in faith at this point. So given that, isn't it premature to say that artificial selection is a strictly Darwinian process as opposed to saying we don't yet understand? I am all for saying we don't yet understand. I, I mean, my peroration, which I read out, said we don't yet understand. What I did add, however, was that because we don't yet understand, um, we do not, uh, therefore, resort to the, the supernatural cop-out. We say we do not yet understand, and we need to, to work on it. Now, um, there are aspects of the world that science certainly doesn't yet understand, and physicists are up against the, some of the most difficult um, qu questions, and many physicists will frankly admit that they don't understand, therefore they're working on it. Um, I don't have very much sympathy for this, what I've called the argument for personal incredulity, which says, I don't yet understand how something works. Um, therefore, it's got to be something mystical. Um, so I, um, I, I regard the, 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 the confronting of things which we don't yet understand as a worthwhile challenge, and it's a challenge that science needs to roll up its sleeves and do something about. It's not, it's not something, it's not an excuse to, to lie down in despair and say, oh, we don't understand it, therefore we'll never understand it. Right, but there are a couple of important points here. First off, we don't want to argue from, from I think it, it, somebody else needs to have a turn now. Uh, thank you. Um, I wanted to know what you thought about, with the advances of medicine, technology, and, and basically the human race's removal from the natural selection process, do you feel uh, we have halted our evolution, or do you think that there's substantial uh, room for um, evolutionary development within the human race? Thank well, you. I think you're asking about um, human-controlled evolution, aren't you? And, and um, um, Well, we know from artificial selection of agricultural animals and plants and, and domestic dogs and so on that um, of the two parts of the Darwinian equation, mutation and selection, Selection is immensely powerful, and selection can turn a wolf into a Pekingese. Uh, I mean, a Pekingese is a wolf, thinks it's a wolf anyway, um, and um, is genetically speaking pretty much a wolf with minor, minor differences. Um, so artificial selection is very powerful, and if anyone were minded to pr practice artificial selection on humans, there's not the slightest doubt but that it would work. And so if you wanted to breed a race of super high jumpers or sprinters or, or something like that. You could certainly do it, just as people have bred greyhounds to be much faster runners and racehorses and so on. Um, so there's, there's no doubt at all that, that breeding of, of humans would work if anyone 
had the stomach to do it. And, and I, I think one could say, fortunately, nobody actually, well, almost nobody has. Hitler tried it, for, for, tried it briefly. Um, the other half of the Darwinian equation, mutation, um, the artificial version of that we would call genetic manipulation. And that, again, is now being practiced with agricultural crops and agricultural animals and experimental animals, and certainly works. Um, and once again, in principle, that, that, would, that would work with humans. And so, uh, again, applying a kind of science fiction-y view, a sort of Arthur C. Clarke view of the distant future, it wouldn't be surprising if the techniques of artificial selection and artificial mutation uh, did indeed produce extremely different um, kinds of, of, of humans. And in a way, the remarkable thing is it hasn't happened yet. Mr. Dawkins, of all of the convictions you've ever had, what is the simplest one that has changed the most? Um, well, I, I suppose I used to have religious convictions. I mean, um, as St. Paul said, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I thought as a child, I understood as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. So um, that, that is an extremely simple idea. Uh, the, the idea of, of, of the, re the religious idea is an extremely uh, simple idea, which um, man many of us have, have put away. I suppose that's probably the, the, the top of the head answer to your, to your question. Thank you. Uh, so, some time ago, you produced a book review of Jean Bricmont's and Alan Sokol's fashionable nonsense. Of what, sorry? Uh, of uh, Jean Bricmont's and uh, Alan oh, Sokol's yes, fashionable yeah, yeah, nonsense yeah, okay. about post structuralist, post modernist types and their anti scientific stances. And uh, this is a fairly liberal institution where you probably won't find many traditional religious reactionary types but you might find a few of the former camp of the, uh, the targets of Brickmont and Sokol. And I was wondering if you could briefly talk about, the, uh, about this former camp. Well, um, th this, is, this is a book um, by um, Alan Sokol, who is the physicist who perpetrated the famous hoax uh, against a, a journal called, I think, Social Text. Um, and he wrote a book later with a Belgian physicist called Jean Brigmont. Um, um, Sokol's hoax was a paper called something like Towards a Transformative Hermeneutics. Um, and it was absolute solid bullshit from beginning to end. It was <laughs> total nonsense. Um, and because it used the sort of um, um, de rigueur, uh, franco phony uh, <laughs> language of postmodernist literary critics, etc., um, they lapped it up and published it. And Sokol then published his expose of his own hoax in, an, in another journal, and the editors of Social Text ended up with egg all over their faces. Um, Sokol and Brickmore wrote a beautiful book which quotes a lot of utterly amazing um, examples. Um, Examples which, um, I mean, I can't possibly quote them. Um, I mean, I, I, they're, they're just amazing. I mean, look at, look at the book or look at my review of the book. Um, Peter Medowa, who's a great hero of mine, a great Nobel Prize winning medical scientist, rumbled these people a very long time ago um, when he said something like this. Um, I could quote evidence of a whispering campaign against the virtues of clarity. A writer in the Times Literary Supplement has argued that thoughts which are difficult to understand are best expressed in language which is deliberately unclear. He goes on, what a preposterously silly idea. I'm reminded of an air raid warden in wartime Oxford who, when somebody complained that the blackout was not being properly observed, advised them to wear dark glasses. <laughs> he, however, was being funny on purpose. Uh, 
Medawar is attacking people who use obscure language, difficult language, deliberately in order to obscure, in order to impress, in order to make people think that you're intelligent, intellectual, and profound, when actually you have absolutely nothing to say. Uh, I forget who it was coined the phrase physics envy. <laughs> physics is a genuinely difficult subject with genuinely difficult material. And physicists who try to explain their subject to lay people strive and struggle mightily to do so. They work hard at trying to find ways of explaining it. If your subject has no depth, has nothing to say, then you can satisfy your physics envy only by using language which is deliberately obscure, going in the opposite direction from the physicists, which, as I've said, are trying to make things, make things clear. Now, I don't know how many people in the school of thought you're talking about are genuine charlatans, but I'm damn sure some of, some of them are, and you can read their, their stuff in Sokol and Brickmore's uh, book, or you can look up a magnificent website, a magnificent computer program on a website called the Postmodernism Generator. <laughs> Did you write it? <laughs> no, no. Um, it was written, I think, by an Australian um, uh, called, called Bullhack. And he, um, and what, what you do is you, is you go there and you just click and it generates for you a complete paper <laughs> of postmodernist claptrap complete with author citations. Everything is there. And as I said at the end of my review, uh, I encourage you to go to the postmodernism generator, print out a paper, send it to the editors of Social Text in triplicate. <laughs> Who is it? Is it? Yeah. Hi. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for being you. Like, you really like, changed me on a personal level. So I really do appreciate that. And a nice tie. Uh, second, I'm quite nervous, so forgive me. I'm going to read uh, a, pre a prepared um, question from earlier, but um, yeah. This uh, refers to the Reason Rally, um, your, your speech there. Um, so I've been following you in, in quite well, and um, I know uh, personally why you yourself call yourself a militant atheist. Um, nonetheless, at least in your life as a public intellectual, I think, and my theist friends would agree, um, that you come across sort of like an atheist magneto. And in that I mean, you employ, like um, the quote from the Reason Rally is that we should be ridiculing theists. Um, I don't think that, I find that inherently unjustifiable um, in that not all Atheists are rational in everyday life, and maybe theists are rational in some ways that atheists aren't. Um, how would you respond to like criticisms that perhaps we shouldn't, like we as atheists, shouldn't be ridiculing um, theists on, on like a, a personal level? Yeah. Um, well, maybe I went too far. Um, <laughs> I, I think what what I meant by ridicule was as opposed to the sort of rude to the point of obscene polemic which many of my colleagues indulge in. And so I, I had been, I was reacting against, and remember the reason Rally is talking to the, um, to the troops, so to speak. And um, the, I'm not really excusing myself, I think I did go too far, but um, the explanation is that some of my colleagues who would have been at the reason Rally um, use language which is um, obscene, uh, which is um, polemical, which is insulting in, in a sort of um, name-calling way. And I was trying to erect ridicule as a more subtle, I, w I was thinking of subtle satire. I was thinking of the kind of thing that Peter Medower, whom I quoted earlier, did so well. I mean, Peter Medower would never have dreamed of calling somebody a fucking idiot, like you'll see on some atheist websites. Um, instead, Peter Medawa used finesse. And I think, that, I mean, that's what I meant by ridicule. Just to give you an example, Medawa reviewed the theologian uh, Father Teilhard de Chardin's famous book, The Phenomenon of Man. 
and he did it beautifully. I mean, every, every line is, is a rapier thrust. And then he ends up asking, how have people come to be taken in by Tayyar de Shada? And he's, he gives various reasons, and his final reason is, he says, the spread of secondary and latterly of tertiary education has bred a large group of people with educated and refined literary and scholarly tastes who have been educated far beyond their capacity to undertake analytical thought. <laughs> now, that's a beautiful thrust. I mean, that, 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 that's the kind of thing I mean. That I was trying to encourage the people at the Reason Rally to employ that kind of satire, that kind of ridicule, um, rather than the kind of, um, uh, of, of outspokenly, really rather unpleasant, um, polemic that that we that we so often see, but I I think you, you're you're right. I probably did go too far. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming to speak to us today. Uh, yesterday was Douglas Adams' 61st birthday. I'm sure you remember. Um, as a result of his adoration for you, I discovered your literature, and I was wondering, after writing The Magic of Reality, how his love for teaching science to young people. It may have impacted or influenced you to write this book and other literature. Yes, um, it, he, he, he was a remarkable writer, and, and um, he, I think, is more or less unique, the sort of science fiction comedy, uh, um, t taking, taking the ideas of science, which do have many absurdities about them. I mean, there, there, there is something absurd about many of the ideas of quantum theory, though it's got to be true because the predictions are so good, and, and somehow turning that into, into comedy. Um, was was a, a magnificent literary achievement, uh, which um, I don't know of anybody else who who, who, do, who does who does that or did did that. Um, I miss him sadly. Uh, he he um, I, I think I'm right in saying it's the only fan letter I've ever written was to him, and um, that resulted in his inviting me to come and see him because he he wrote me a fan letter as well, and and so um, we always got on very well. He he was my guru on all, anything to do with computers, especially um, uh, Apple Macintosh computers. Um, and so I would always go to him, and he would, his advice was always wry and funny and, and, and sort of he kept laughing at himself. He was just a, just a lovely, lovely man. Um, miss him so much. Uh, and I, he introduced me to my wife um, on, on his 40th birthday which is another sentimental reason for. Hi, yeah. thank you. Um, so I wanted to ask, do you uh, know of any evidence for uh, the concept that perhaps particular humans are uh, genetically predisposed to logic or to belief uh, without proof? Sorry, who, who is? Uh, any particular humans, whether there's a genetic basis for rationality. Well, um, It, it's, it's an interesting philosophical question um, wh why our brains are good at doing logic, why our brains are good at um, doing, doing science, indeed. Um, and some people have even argued that because our brains are the product of natural selection, we therefore should somehow should mistrust our logic. Um, I, I think you could make a pretty good Darwinian case for why we would be logical and rational. Um, if you're trying to survive in the African savanna with lions and leopards and snakes and things and running out of food and running out of water and so on, um, your view of the world had better not be cockeyed. Your view of the world had better correspond with reality or you're going to die. I mean, you need to have a rational view of the world. In a way, the, pu the puzzle is why why we, we, we also developed an irrational view of the world, Why we why instead of just getting on with the business of living and planting our crops and, and things, we would sacrifice a goat in order to make the crops grow, um, wasting time and wasting goats um, <laughs> to, to, do, to do it. Um, but, 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 but I don't think we need to ask where our logic comes from, where our rationality comes from. It's rather the reverse. Is that one, one more there? All right, no, uh, the questions have concluded for the evening. Well, questions have concluded for the evening. However, uh, 
if it's all right, we'll have you out signing books. Yes, of course. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you for attending very much.